Hey everybody, Ryan here and welcome back to our oral surgery series. In this video, we're going to talk about orofacial pain. So the first thing we need to talk about is the biopsychosocial model of pain. And so this model generally categorizes orofacial pain into two axes. Axis one refers to the bio part of this word. And so that's the nociceptive input from somatic tissue, what we generally consider acute pain. Some stimulus affects tissue and we feel pain. Axis two refers to the psychosocial part of the word. And this involves an influence of interaction between the thalamus, the cortex, and the limbic structures. This is more characteristic of chronic pain. So as pain becomes chronic, these axis two factors tend to take over. And chronic pain is that which lasts generally longer than four to six months. So what we take away from this is it's not just about the tooth, which is axis one pain, but also consider the person with the tooth that involves this psychosocial component of more long lasting chronic pain. So the pain pathway generally consists of four major steps. First, we start with transduction, where the pain information travels from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. Then we have transmission, where pain information travels from the central nervous system, here in the spinal cord, up into the thalamus and the higher cortical centers. Thirdly, we also have modulation, this descending modulation where the central nervous system is limiting the flow of pain information. And then we finally have perception, which is the human experience of pain being the sum total of these physiological processes and then also the psychological factors of higher thought and emotion. So considering that psychosocial component of chronic pain. Now we can get a little bit more involved and in, into the weeds. There are dorsal column lemniscus and anterolateral pain pathways, a bunch of different nerve pathways that you do not need to know for part two of the board exam. They are tested on part one. So if I eventually start making part one videos, we can definitely cover those, uh, those pathways in that kind of video. But for part two, this is all you need to know for the pain pathway. So we're gonna talk about four major categories of pain, and they all fit in the continuum of axis one and axis two factors. So the first category is somatic pain. And so somatic pain is where you have an increased stimulus yielding an increased pain. So this is what you typically would view as our day-to-day -day dental patient in pain. So we have musculoskeletal pain, which involves the TMJ, which will have a whole video on temporomandibular disorders in the next video, a periodontal pain, muscular pain, which is also called myofascial pain. We also have visceral pain, and this involves the salivary glands and the pulp, the nerves of each individual tooth. So these are the two main subcategories of somatic pain. And visceral pain we talked about in our very first endo video. We talked about dentinal and pulpitis pain and how you have activation of A delta and C fibers respectively to the spinal cord or the brain stem. So if you, already, uh, if you haven't already checked out my endodontic series on pain, to learn more about A delta and C fibers, go check that out. So our second category of pain is the neuropathic pain. And this will be the most, most important category in terms of this video. And we'll dive into different examples of neuropathic pain. So whereas somatic pain was dependent on the, the magnitude of the stimulus, neuropathic pain is independent of the stimulus intensity. So it involves some sort of damage to those pain pathways that we talked about before. 
and some examples of this are trigeminal neuralgia, stroke, and trauma. So trigeminal neuralgia. This is probably, actually this is definitely the most important slide of this entire video. So you're almost guaranteed to get at least one question on trigeminal neuralgia, either on day one or day two of the exam. So I definitely would strongly encourage you to commit all of this information to memory. So trigeminal neuralgia is also called tic de la rue, and it, infect, it affects mostly postmenopausal women older than 50. That's the main, uh, it's typically the sixth decade of life is most common. Women are most commonly affected, but it can occur at any age. And since we're talking about trigeminal neuralgia, there, there's neuralgia for every cranial nerve, but trigeminal neuralgia refers to this nerve pain, alga meaning pain, of the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve number five. So it's going to affect any or all of these branches of cranial nerve five, those being V1, V2, and V3. And this is a nerve map showing V1, V2, and V3, uh, they're the regions of the face that they are supplying. So there's typically a trigger point involved with trigeminal neuralgia. You touch one part of the face and it sends this electrical sharp shooting and episodic pain, followed by refractory periods. So in other words, pain is brief, it can be a few seconds, up to one or two minutes long, and it's episodic, it's paroxys paroxysmal is another word to say that. Paroxysmal means there are sudden spasmodic attacks. So pain may occur several times a day, and patients typically experience no pain between episodes during these refractory periods of relief. It's typically unilateral. It's going to affect one side of the face because it'll affect one side of the cranial nerve. So it'll either be, it could be V1, V2, and V3, all of the left side of the face or of the right side of the face. Rarely it's bilateral affecting both the right and left sides. Now there is some limited effectiveness treatment available. For the board exam, I would know anticonvulsants are the treatment of choice and carbamazepine is a good example of an anticonvulsant prescribed to treat trigeminal neuralgia. You can also do some neurosurgery, which gets a little bit more involved. Our next example of neuropathic pain is atypical odontalgia. And again, we can unpack this name, atypical, not normal, odo, odont, talking about a tooth, and alga, is pain. So we can unpack this as not typical tooth pain, and that's exactly what it is. So it's secondary to deafferentation, which means removal of part of the neural pathway as a result of endodontic therapy or extraction. So another way of defining deafferentation is partial or total loss of the afferent neural activity to a particular body region by removing part of that neural pathway. So a pulpectomy would be an example, as with tooth extraction. We're literally removing the tooth and any nerve source, any source of afferentation that that tooth was supplying. So a pulpectomy, we're removing that, that nerve, or we could just pull the whole tooth and remo remove the nerve that way. So thinking about it in this way, removing the nerve should lead to anesthesia but it can also cause this kind of pain. And this deafferentation pain is perceived in a localized area, resulting again from the loss or disruption of the afferent neural pathway. And we can think of it like a phantom toothache. So this is analogous to phantom limb pain. If you've ever heard of this sensation, it's an ongoing painful sensation that seems to be coming from the part of the limb that's no longer there following amputation. So phantom toothache is a very real sensation. And again, it's not dependent on the stimulus intensity. 
it's neuropathic pain, it's not somatic pain. Here's another example, post-herpetic neuralgia. And we can unpack this word to mean after herpes nerve pain. And that's exactly what it is. It's a potential sequela or side effect of herpes zoster infection. Remember, from our oral pathology series, herpes zoster is the varicella zoster virus, or VZV. It's not the same as herpes simplex virus. And so that's a very easy way for test makers to trick you up on the question. So this is not a sequela of herpes simplex, but rather herpes zoster. And this involves uh, this burning, aching, or shock-like type of pain. The treatment for this, again, you can use anticonvulsants, antidepressants, or sympathetic blocks. Here's another example of neuropathic pain, burning mouth syndrome. This is particularly important for dentists to be aware of. So again, just like trigeminal neuralgia, this typically affects postmenopausal women older than 50. But again, it can affect anybody. It's associated with type 2 diabetes, malnutrition, and xerostomia, or dry mouth. And that makes sense to have this burning, painful dryness feeling, maybe even altered taste sensation. So that's about burning mouth syndrome. And then also we have chronic headache, another form of neuropathic pain. It can also be referred to as neurovascular pain. And so when we think of chronic headache, there are various types. Perhaps migraine is the most popular or the most notorious as this unilateral pulsating. It induces this nausea and vomiting. And also, most importantly for the board exam, photophobia and phonophobia. This is this um, distaste for anything that's loud or any noises at all and any sort of light stimulation. So someone being impacted by a migraine usually would want to lie down in bed with the lights off and with very minimal sound. Tension type headaches are bilateral, non-pulsating, and not aggravated by routine activity. And I'm not talking here about like going to the gym. That would probably irritate a tension type headache. This is more walking around doing routine daily activity. And lastly, we have cluster headache. This is more intense pain focused around one eye. And so for the migraine, the treatment of choice would be a triptan. There are many different triptans out there, but triptans can be very effective and they are selective serotonin receptor agonists. And to round out our discussion of orofacial pain, I promise there are four different categories, and here are the last two. We have psychogenic pain, and this involves an intrapsychic disturbance like conversion reaction, psychotic delusion, or malingering. And atypical pain is sort of this facial pain that doesn't fit in any of the other three categories. It's of unknown cause and or the diagnosis is pending. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my dedicated patrons for all of their support. We've been, we already hit our first goal. I've purchased a brand new professional microphone, so hopefully you're enjoying the improved audio quality. It's all thanks to my patrons over there. If you support me there, you can unlock extras like having access to all of these video slides uh, so you can take notes on them and additional practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.